Hello my friends and welcome to the Thor Zone. I'm here in Iceland where I'll be spending this Christmas with my family. I want to share today a couple of things. The first one being a story and the second one involving the saxophone. So, before I came to Iceland, the weekend before, I was walking around in, in London. Um, I had my phone stolen, robbed, if you will, um, by some guys who then proceeded to drain my bank account and all sorts of stuff, um, which obviously wasn't nice to deal with, pretty horrible to deal with, to be honest, but it did teach me a lot about um, about gratefulness and being happy for what we have. Um, for me, at this moment, I am grateful to be here with my family, watching this with all of you. Now, without further ado, A smooth Christmas.
from the Liquid Modern family to yours. Oh, hi there. I'm Fox Puppy. The folks at Absinthe have offered to let me share some of my thoughts with you this festive holiday season, so I wanted to share some of my favorite holiday music so that you and your loved ones can enjoy them too. First off, there's the Lo-Fi Ambient Xmas albums by Binaural Space. Jan of Binaural Space is a very unique musician. And these albums combine his love of progressive electronic music and classic Christmas melodies to make music that's beautiful and atmospheric. The result's a sound that fills the room with an air of festivity and serenity. Jetfire Prime is a musician who makes excellent music for so many occasions. His Happy Merry Synthmas series is perfect for someone who wants Christmas music that combines themes with the fun retro-futuristic synthwave sound. At last count, there were four of these on Bandcamp, though a fifth one may be coming soon. Alpha Chrome Yeo is the gift that keeps on giving. In 2021, he gave us his Big Cozy Christmas album, a collection of tracks, some fun, some emotional, but all the, with that unique Alpha Chrome style to get you and yours in the mood for a fantastic holiday. A favorite of the Missus, the Christmas Asaurus series, is a massively weird collection of strange, indescribable music full of festive holiday cheer and the occasional bit of obscenity to give you an antidote to ordinary Christmas music. System Glitch and Demi K released a version of Carol of the Bells that fans of synthwave and prog rock will love. It's equal parts intense and beautiful and I do enjoy an intense and beautiful carol. And finally, one of my favorite songs ever, holiday or otherwise, would have to be All Is Bright by the unique vocalist Annie, with two E's. With vo piano and string arrangement by Ian Eisendrath and co-production by the one and only Von Herzog, they've created one of the most beautifully haunting songs you could want on your holiday playlist. Though I will admit I've listened to it multiple times throughout the year, not just at Christmas. It's hard to imagine a more beautiful song for the holidays. So, that's my list. Though there's a lot of other great music available on Bandcamp for your holiday playlists. Head on over to Bandcamp.com and buy these and many others today to support independent music and give some unique sound and style to your Christmas playlists this year. So, from my family to yours, have a merry, scenty Christmas and a happy new year. Dad, you need something to cut wrapping paper with. Oh. Here you go, sweetheart. Thank you.
and fam. Chris here. So some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I consider myself more of a fan than a prolific musician, um, but I'm working on it. When I volunteered to contribute a video to this awesome holiday special, uh, I had absolutely no idea what it was going to be. And to be completely honest, uh, at the time of filming, I'm still more than a bit hazy on the concept. So I think the main reason I'm here is to give you all a holiday message of thanks. I'm so thankful for having met you all and getting to listen to, be inspired by our amazing music and art. Um, 
to be able to chat with some of you daily on socials. You really, you can't, I can't stress this enough. You've really been an inspiration uh, to me to continue my own musical journey, be it, you know, tr trying to <laughs> work out how to play this thing um, with any proficiency or even, you know, going after some of my own electronic music. Um, just being able to connect and see your day-to-day -day, uh, progress has, you know, really, you know, as I said, inspired me. Um, so with that, my simple message is happy holidays and please keep doing what you're doing. It's, it's amazing. But before I go, the amazing Thorison did suggest I could play a Christmas song on my guitar. Now, while the idea is intriguing, I wasn't sure what Christmas song I would actually want to learn. Um, and what would you want to hear? Jingle Bell Rock? Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer? I don't know, maybe, maybe if Serena sung it, it'd be more interesting. But then it hit me. So without further ado, here is a very short <laughs> snippet from a very important Christmas song from the definitive Christmas movie, Beethoven's Ode to Joy from Die Hard. Here it is. Happy holidays, everyone! Hey everyone, I hope you're well. Uh, I just wanted to jump on and say a happy Christmas from me at Electrodrome and happy Christmas from everyone at Absinthe. Thank you so much for listening into Electrodrome on the radio every week and for tuning in to us on Absinthe. That means the world to us. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful break and you're looking forward to a great new year as well. In a minute, I'm going to give you a rundown of my favourite mince pies of 2022. I know that's why we're all here. Uh, I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear I've been out there in the world testing them for you. Um, first of all, though, I do just want to have a little look back at some of my favourite moments from Absinthe this year. I think right up there has to be our interview with Dubstar. Uh, it was the first show we ran on YouTube, on the YouTube channel. An amazing moment for me interviewing some real UK indie royalty. I loved hearing Chris and Sarah's stories from being in the band and writing and recording with Stephen Haig as well. A historic time in, in UK indie. That was really special. Um, uh, meeting Enna Mori, the Filipino synth pop artist was incredible as well. She was super cool. It was kind of fun just to hear her and Serena talking about memories of Manila. Um, and we had a brilliant time with Harold Heath as well, reminiscing about DJ culture and learning more about the craft. That was really great. Harold was great fun. I have lost count of the number of times this year that I've entered the Thora Zone. I think I might still be there. Maybe I never left, who knows. Uh, and I want to say a big thank you to Zarina and Thorison for everything they've done on Absinthe and to Lee and Marcus and the whole Radio Wigwam team who help put the show together every week with their brilliant recommendation. I want to give out my mince pie ranking for 2022. So far, I have sampled some absolute beauties. Uh, pleased to say I've been out there in the world um, sampling mince pies for you including what I think is probably the nicest mince pie, the nicest single mince pie I've ever tasted. Okay, we're going to start off um, with a little refresher uh, just on what a mince pie is. A mince pie is a sweet sort of dessert style snacky small pie. It's made of pastry, dried fruit and some kind of undescript uh, syrupy stuff, uh, sort of syrupy jam stuff. 
It is not a minced pie, like uh, M-I-N-C-E-D. It is a mince pie without the D on the end. Um, it also doesn't contain mints, as in minced meat. Uh, although uh, the mince that is used in a mince pie is called mince meat without the D. Mince meat, if you see what I mean. Um, according to a recent pub quiz that I did, uh, originally mince pies did have meat in them. So that is a little confusing. They now don't have meat in them. Although they are not vegetarian. So uh, they have a thing called suet in them. Uh, which is like animal fat, which binds the fruit together. It's probably also why they taste quite nice as well. Uh, you can do vegetarian ones, by the way. There are some great uh, recipes out there. Um, the one I love to make at home is from the amazing Delia Smith. God bless you, Delia. I hope you're having a great Christmas. Um, they taste amazing. I like to sample as many as possible each year. Uh, first of all, I want to give a special shout out to everybody's favourite posh UK supermarket, Waitrose. Uh, the first one I tried this year was a Waitrose mince pie. It was a uh, brown butter mince pie. Well worth trying. They are quite boozy, so if you don't like a boozy mince pie, these ones do have extra cognac in them. A strong start this year from Waitrose, 8 out of 10 for the brown butter mince pies. Just to make sure that Waitrose were on their game, I also tried their all butter mince pies. Um, they are an absolute classic. Um, so, you know, if you have to choose one, I'd, I'd highly recommend them. They're not as boozy, so they don't leave you feeling like you've just kissed your grandma after her Christmas sherry. Um, they are a bit of a classic. I would give them an 8.5 out of 10 strong effort from Waitrose. Now, just to complete the Waitrose range, I have not tried Waitrose essential mince pies. But I do want to give a little shout out to Waitrose for even suggesting that a mince pie is an essential item. They also do Heston Blumenthal vegan cherry and almond, uh, fig and pear and mini mince pies. So there's plenty for me still to try. Um, good start from Waitrose. Now this year I have had the misfortune, I'm sad to say, of once again being tricked into eating a Mr Kipling mince pie. As usual it was stodgy as hell. Pastry seems to have some sort of anti-aging agent in it, which is gross. Um, it's a fairly weak 3 out of 10. It also kind of gets stuck to the roof of your mouth, which is a bit unpleasant. Uh, I would not recommend them. Uh, for fairness as well, I've also tried Sainsbury's Taste the Difference. Uh, uh, they were, they're highly underrated, I think, in, in my point of view. Uh, they always seem to be on offer. You can pick up a box for about £1.50 or £1.75. That is a bargain for six of the finest mince pies. Um, they are not as boozy as previous years. I'm going to give them a solid 7 out of 10. I do want to give out a shout out to Rose's Cafe in Shefford, um, who served me an absolute horror show of a mince pie this year. Uh, it looked more like two very thin pieces of pastry with a little sort of um, bit of mince meat uh, sort of uh, spread in between it, almost like jam. That was an absolute disaster. It was very dry, one out of ten. Finally, this is a very unfair inclusion, uh, the, easily the best mince pie I've had this year and probably the best I've ever had was from Violet Cakes in Hackney. Now the reason that is a bit of an unfair comparison, it's the bakery that made Harry and Meghan's wedding cake, so not really fair competition for others. It was deep, it was tasty, it was not too boozy. It was fresh, it was crumbly, and it had a very nice little dusting of icing sugar on the top as well. A 10 out of 10 from me. That is my mince pie rundown. Uh, there'll probably be more to come. Uh, there's plenty of time left in Christmas for me to sample more. Thank you so much to everybody who listened to Electrodrome this year. It's been brilliant uh, to, to be on the show. It's been a great ride. Thank you to Lee, thank you to Marcus, thank you to Radio Wigwam, and thank you to Zarina and Thorison and Absinthe. Uh, been great to be on the show. Thank you to everybody who listens in, tunes into Absinthe. We absolutely love the community, uh, love having everybody with us. It's been a lot of fun. I will see you next year. Go and sample some mince pies. If they are not available in the country you are in, let me know. I'm sure we can arrange a visit for you to sample some in the UK. Merry Christmas to you all. Have a great new year and a brilliant break. See you later. Bye. Hey friends, Alpha Chrome Yale here, wishing you and everyone at Absinthe a very, very Merry Christmas. If you're familiar with what I do, you might know that I make surreal music with jazz fusion and city pop leanings. And you also might know that I love cooking for my family and friends. 
and you are my friends. So this year, instead of playing a song for you, I'm going to take you for a trip into my kitchen and show you how I make a delicious Christmas ham. So apologies if you don't eat meat, but I'm going to do some righteous sides as well, and there'll be a few techniques you can translate across the board and make something delicious. Let's go! So first you're going to want to get a load of pork, maybe a leg cut or gammon, from your butcher uh, and weigh it up. This one is clocking in at about 2 kilograms or so, and about now a hungry dog might appear in your kitchen. I'm going to boil the ham first with some bits of veg and garlic and bay and stuff, all nicely chopped. In it goes into a pan, uh, and I'm also going to get some nice fresh ginger, give it a big hard whack, boom, uh, and chuck that in to, uh, to impart mega flavour. The pork goes in next, and we're going to cover it up with water, uh, or at least as much as humanly possible, because it's a big old boy! Now, the next thing that goes in is a bit of Hondashi Bonito stock. You don't really need this, but it imparts just an unbelievable amount of umami goodness, and it means you can use the base for a tasty ramen afterwards, if that's something you would like to do. Cover it up, and for one of this size, we're going to want to bring this to the boil, uh, and boil it slash steam it here for about 35 minutes or so. While that's doing its thing, we can make the glaze. I'm going to do a honey mustard type deal. So here's some good English mustard, loads of honey, uh, more than you see going in here. Just just put shit loads of it in. Uh, and Worcester sauce, Lee and Perrins. Again, big umami bastard. So delicious. So plenty of that. Some mixed spice next. It's got bits of orange peel and stuff in it too. It's really tasty. Uh, and then some ground cloves and ground ginger as well. You don't need an awful lot, but a decent old amount to give it that festive mmm. -hmm. I know they say you should never go can to pan or whatever it is, but oh, I don't give a shit. It's Christmas. Let's go. Put loads of it in. Sugar next and plenty of it. Then stir it all up over a medium heat to get everything doing the stuff until you get something that looks glossy and lovely and deliciously brown. Mmm. Next, we're going to move on to the potatoes. Uh, being an Ireland, we have ready access to the best potatoes in the whole world. Uh, so peel them, chop them up, get the best you can and throw them in a uh, pan, roughly cut and covered with cold water. Now, I use these Wolverine Claw style deals here to take out our steamed hams, non Utica style, and use a sharp knife to take off the butcher string and cut some crisscrosses into the fat. It's in a roasting dish now, and we add in some of the juices and a bit of veg uh, and cover it up. Now, uh, well, it's hard to do that with one hand when I'm filming it as well, so, you know, it might take a couple of tries, but eventually we'll get the lid on just right. Now into the oven it goes, preheated to 180 degrees Celsius or whatever that is in Fahrenheit, I am not sure. It'll need about 2 hours and 20 minutes, so let's get the carrots ready in the meantime. I've cut them rangiri style, which is a Japanese method uh, which basically makes loads of surface area, i.e. loads of flavour. It's very cool and I recommend looking it up. Cover them up with water, uh, and I don't know about you, but I'm just about ready for a little Christmas drink. Why not? I've got some nice Portuguese rosé wine here, uh, which I think that's technically a champagne flute, but hey, who gives a shit? Let's enjoy it and take a breather. Oh, yes! Broken Game Boy for Christmas. That's the only gift for me. Stick it in my stocking, please. Now, back to business, chop up a shitload of garlic. We're going to use this to make uh, a roux for a sauce. So, it's a bit of oil and a good old whack of butter goes into a pan over a medium heat. And stir it all up until it gets nice and melty. Basically, we're making like a nice, light, delicate sauce. Because, hey, I'm a light, delicate dude, right? Flour next uh, uh, to kind of form the roux. Stir that up too until you get something like this. The garlic goes in next until it gets kind of caramelised sort of looking and a little bit of milk at a time and stir it up. Don't worry if it's a bit bitty, it'll kind of become normal in a while. Worcester sauce now and then a little bit of salt and pepper, some ground nutmeg and bay leaves, splash of wine and then keep stirring that over a medium heat. We can leave that to thicken up so just stir it now and again and get the potatoes ready. Cover them up and boil them for about 10 minutes or so, then drain off most of the water. Now, there's a few things we can do to make our roast potatoes extra crispy and delicious. First of all, kind of bash them about a bit. We want to try and make some rough edges. Yeah, whack them like they owe you money. Basically, we're trying to get as much surface area as possible, again, to make it crispy. Cornmeal or polenta next. Salt and pepper and stir it all up. Next, they go into hot oil. You can use any kind of vegetable oil or anything you like. I like duck fat. Uh, just be really careful not to burn yourself and get them all tossed. Then they go in the oven with the ham. Check on the sauce. It's, if it's a wee bit bitty like this, just keep on stirring and working. It'll sort itself out. 
After a while I add some carrots or other root veg covered in oil too, that goes in the oven and now it's time to glaze the ham. It's got about 45 minutes left at this stage. If you have a fancy little brush, use that or just a fork or spoon and cover the ham entirely, getting into all the nooks and crannies. Sorry to make that sound gross, get some of the cooking juices too and add that to your sauce. Now after about 50 minutes, 45-50 minutes, we're nearly done, the potatoes are looking great, believe me, these are crispy little bastards. Now let's take a look at the main event. And holy shit, we are basically done. Look at that big old golden fellow. <laughs> um, leave it for about 10-15 minutes to kind of settle and, and all the good stuff. Once it's rested, slice it up as thick or thin as you like and admire your good work. Your house probably smells amazing right now, so you might have a horde of hungry neighbours at your door. Or maybe they just want to come and see you, because you're so damn nice. Plate it up with the sauce and veg, and pat yourself on the back. You did it! And there we have it, a big old festive ham for your Yuletide tummies. I hope you enjoyed it very much, and if you like what I do and want to check out more music and more cooking, you can get both over on my Bandcamp. Thank you very much for watching from the bottom of my heart and thank you to Absinthe too again for having me. Christmas is lovely but it can be a difficult time of year as well and sweet moments like this make it all that bit more special. Bye for now. Hello Absinthe, happy holidays, happy Yule, Saturnalia, what else, solstice. Christmas, Hanukkah, there's more. Got my fake um, fireplace going. I am going to read to you this uh, book that we rented from the library. And you can't see the title, so I'm gonna read it to you. Christmas, a short history from solstice to Santa. Sounds like my type of book. It's got a little Santa on it and it is by Andy Thomas. So uh, shout out to our local library. So let's talk about Ancient Christmas, chapter one. We are starting off with a motherfucking Stonehenge. In my opinion, let's just say, in my opinion, the innate language of humans and animals is the language of cycles and seasons are part of a cycle our circadian rhythm sleep cycles hormonal cycles and so it's no surprise like i'm not saying anything crazy when i say the ancients marked certain holidays with uh, parallel to, I guess, I would say the tilt of the Earth's axis. Places like Stonehenge seem to have some type of seasonal clock to them. Although um, we don't really understand quite, um, can't really fucking figure it out, can we? So it was assumed that England's famous Stonehenge monument in Wiltshire was made for midsummer, like to mark midsummer, but primarily used for the winter solstice. What is the winter solstice? Well, solstice is derived from the Latin word sol, which means sun, and sister, I'm not saying this right, which means to stand still. So it quite literally means the sun stands still. Still, what the naked eye sees for three days or so from the winter solstice is the sun rising and setting in effectively identical places. But then around December 25th, positions begin to change and the sun starts its new cycle toward lighter days. For the ancients, this was a momentous time because it meant they could now definitely look forward to life becoming just that little bit more survivable again. Sol Invictus and Saturnalia. Okay. Um, Christmas was greatly influenced by Roman beliefs. Much of Europe and North Africa were once part of that empire, and its pagan traditions had a surprising influence on the Christian holiday. 
In fact, in addition to Jesus, a number of significant deities from antiquity are said to share December 25th as their ceremonial birthday. What are those deities? Some say that the Roman sun god, I'm, I, I love how I'm holding this up, but they probably can't see a fucking thing. Some say that the Roman sun god, Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun, or Helios to the Greeks, was a deity who celebrated his birthday on or around December 25th. Mithras, originally a Persian god, was another popular Roman deity in the first centuries, especially among soldiers, because it was believed that following the rites of Mithras, or Mithras, made for a smoother passage to the afterlife. Some claim that almost every ancient god had a December 25th birthday, but academic studies suggest that this is too sweeping of a statement. What is for certain, though, is that the visual depiction of Sol Invictus, complete with the halo, was picked up and transferred seamlessly to the early Roman depictions of Jesus and that Roman festivals, especially Saturnalia and the New Year Calendar, helped form many Christian traditions. What is Saturnalia and Calendar? Saturnalia is a ancient Roman festival. So this was a joyous and sometimes debauched remembrance of the golden age of when the god Saturn, which is also Kronos in uh, the Greek mythos, when pe so, th so they say that when Saturn ruled, the people of that time lived in complete peace and harmony and abundance. And they, you know, they said it was the golden age back then when, when he ruled, so. So it involved drinking, partying, sex, def definitely sex, for sure sex, role reversal. And so there would be a master of ceremonies, which I cannot pronounce. They were like the appointed like director of the festivities. And this person would make sure everybody was having a good fucking time. The solar new year calendar followed Saturnalia on January 1st to the 3rd. And in this holiday, you gave gifts, delicacies, pastries, baked goods, figs, honey, and reaching out to others. And that custom still remains today. Oh, what we've come to the Magi chapter. This is interesting because there's some astrological uh, influence here, which is fun. It's like a holiday story written by astrologers and occultists. Okay, so the wise men or three kings of the nativity only appear in Matthew's gospel and are often referred to as the magi or magi. Uh, this is where we get the word magic from. Some Eastern churches give the number of wise men as 12, perhaps suggesting an allegorical connection to the 12 signs of the zodiac. Why didn't they leave that? The popular depiction of three appears to be inferred from the description of the Magi's three gifts, suggesting the same number of givers and trinities are repeated themes in Christianity and other mystic traditions. So what they're saying, what this person is saying here is that there were three gifts given, but there could have been 12 occultists. Okay, so we're getting to the part where I have to describe and explain how Jesus may have not been a Capricorn, which is fucking heresy to me, and could have been a Leo. Honestly, if we take it further with astrology and history, it like totally makes more sense. Um, but the Capricorns have claimed Jesus. A number of researchers believe that Jesus was probably born in July instead of December, with some suggesting the date of July 29th, 7 BCE. Oh, this is fucking interesting. In some of the nativity scenes, two of the wise men are shown standing or kneeling together, which may indicate Saturn and Jupiter in their conjunction around this date. Conjun conjunction means when, a, when two planets or more are together in the sky. While the third magi, who could represent the planet Mercury, is set apart. The shepherds may represent particular stars, with the animals in the stable indicating some of the zodiac signs. With many modern astrologers seeing the era of Jesus as being the beginning of the age of Pisces, 
And given to that the zodiac sign is represented by two fish, which is a symbolism for Christianity, it may be that these conjunctions in Pisces became misremembered as a star, and it has been even suggested that the common placements of the characters in nativity scenes may be deliberately encoded depictions of the sky in 7 BCE. And that concludes that conspiracy theory. Right, so there is a figure called La Bafana in Italy, and she is like a witch, like an old witchy woman. The story is that the the three wise men knocked on her door on the way to Bethlehem, right? And like she brought them in and she like fed them and stuff. And she's like, oh, where are you going? And they're like, oh, we're following that star. Have you not heard? And she's like, yeah, I heard, but I'm too busy cleaning. And then they were like, you can come with us. And she's like, oh no, thank you very much. I'm cleaning tonight. Yule and the Wild Hunt. The influence of their Norse mythology with its own pantheon of gods and customs began to spread, even as Christianity was welling up in competition. Each winter, it was believed that the great god Odin would lead the wild hunt across the sky, a dark and rowdy supernatural chase of otherworldly beings. Belief in this, together with the marking of the solstice, gave rise to a major festive period that took place between mid-November and early January. The hunt might have astronomical or astrological connotations. Some even say paranormal. Who can claim the honor of setting up the first Christmas tree? Druids sometimes decorated trees as, a, as signs of veneration and tree worship was known among Vikings and Saxons. Meanwhile, using evergreens for winter decorations go back well before the Christian era with cultures from Egypt and China to Scandinavia using fresh branches to symbolize life and safety in dark times. The Ascent of Santa Claus. If you do read A Christmas Carol, you may notice that the ghost of Christmas present, a full bearded jovial giant in robes and furs, reminds us of another character who was making his full emergence into habitual festive folklore around the time of its publication. The origins of this kind of figure, though, go back a lot further. The academic view of this bearded merry fellow is that he is a blend of several personifications of the season, principally the English version who emerges from the 1400s onward and finally becomes known as Father Christmas in the 17th century and largely Dutch American Santa Claus based loosely on the legendary figure of Saint Nicholas known in the Netherlands as Sinterklaas. Some countries have seasonal gift givers more distinctive to their own cultures. Iceland sees the visitation of 13 separate deities or entities uh, which are called Yule Lads over 13 days. Russia and the Slavic regions welcome Grandfather Frost or Dead Moroz, Old Man Frost, frequently seen in blue robes, while some Germanic and Dutch regions have Bell's Nickel, a dark, grumpy character, not unlike like a male version of uh, Italy's La Bafana. The earliest reference to a great being who soared in the skies around the solstice would seem to be of the Norse god Odin, like we said before, who led the ghostly wild hunt across the sky at Yuletide. Later tales tell of his flying across the world on his curiously eight-legged horse bearing gifts for the good, but in some variations, abducting the bad. The multi-legged horse may have become the multiple legs of flying reindeer, and the wild hunt turned into a friendly tour of generosity around the globe. As to why reindeer might be flying in the first place, here we go, the shamanic cultures of the Arctic Circle, not far from Father Christmas's home in the North Pole, may provide an answer. The Sami people of northern Scandinavia and Siberia celebrate the shamanic properties of the Amanita muscaria, or uh, which is a mushroom. It is a attractive red mushroom with white spots. Eating it can be damaging to your health. The detrimental qualities were believed to be modified, however, if they were boiled or if the urine of a uh, reindeer who loved to eat this um, mushroom was drunk instead. 
After this, the hallucinogenic properties of the mushroom may have made it easy to imagine that one was flying with the reindeer. And the traditional red and white colors of Santa perhaps have more meaning than we see eye. With the Victorian reinvention of the season, Father Christmas was revived and reinstated as a celebratory figurehead. Although at first he looked distinctly pagan, often depicted as a bearded druidic veteran bearing holly and even riding a Yule goat. One oft quoted myth, and it is a myth, is that the Coca-Cola company invented the classic red and white Santa with their Christmas poster campaigns, which began in the 1930s. While certainly influential, the fact that its corporate colors happened to match Santa's garb was just a coincidence. Red and white depictions were established long before, and we all have already explored one possible origin of the color palette. Although um, the British Father Christmas was often seen in green robes in earlier years, and the public pull towards red and white was made stronger by increasingly homogenized cards, posters, and advertisements. Russia and Slavic regions have been more resistant, often sticking to Grandfather Frost's blue, blue robes. This may continue an older tradition because Odin, the ancient forerunner of all such characters, is said to have sometimes worn a blue hood. The Green Father Christmas, meanwhile, has enjoyed minor revivals in parts of England, but there's no doubt red is the dormant costume of choice. Ooh. Christmas characters, here we go. Santa may be the most famous Christmas character, but he is far from the only one. Around the world, regional variations on familiar themes turn up for the holidays. Some are kind and whimsical, but others are grotesque and sinister. The German seasonal character Bell's Nickel, for instance, is a scarier relation of Santa Claus, dishing out punishments to bad children, even as he re rewards the good. There is the Perchta, sometimes Berchta, a Bafana-like female figure derived from an ancient Germanic goddess, particularly popular in Slovenia and Austria. Although she is kind to hardworking children, leaving silver coins for them over Christmas, and especially on Twelfth Night, she, she also has a less endearing habit of disemboweling the lazy and replacing their insides with straw and pebbles. When I die, I am coming back as a winter deity and I'm going to dole out uh, punishments and rewards. A moment of stillness. Christmas offers a rare but liberating breakdown of normality with its glowing lights and colors, nostalgic aromas, distinctive food, and warming drinks. If the thrill of Christmas has been forgotten, it is worth remembering the magic and joy many of us felt as children and seeing the festival through those eyes again. If you stop to look beyond the paraphernalia of the modern Christmas and think about how this festival can make you feel, there remains a tangible aura around it that is easy to miss in all the rush. Children experience its purity in the most, but without too much effort. The atmosphere of the season can still touch the hearts of adults. There is an undeniably distinctive quality about this annual nexus point. Perhaps something about the solstice itself might one day be identified to explain it. Maybe it is a subtle human response to the qualities of winter light and weather, or even the psychic accumulation of aeons of focus on the celebration. The devout see the divine at work, whether it may be there is something unique about the annual cycle we now call Christmas. If Christmas is, in the end, a feeling above anything else, then it is worth trying to find a moment over the festive period to tune into it. This is not always easy for those who have to juggle entertaining, decorating, wrapping, and cooking. But if you consciously select a time to suspend all of that for just a few minutes, you can create a small eye of calm at the center. One useful opportunity comes in the early hours of Christmas Day itself, or Christmas Eve. Something churches tap into with midnight services. It is a time when a stillness starts to fall, roads begin to empty, revelers make their way home, and excited children are finally persuaded to sleep. A collective buzz of hushed anticipation and tangible quietness, unlike any other, combined for a few hours as the silent night arrives. How then to best use this little window? To create a valuable moment of stillness, find a snug and tranquil place, perhaps by the tree. 
turn the room lights low and just be with Christmas. Within a few hours, a delightful madness of the day will begin and another opportunity may not arise. Your thoughts might drift to all the many different facets this festival has sparked over the centuries, from the ancient standing ready to welcome the first discernible signs of the sun's return, to civilizations marking the births of their messiahs or commemorating wild hunts across the sky, from the taking down of normal boundaries and indulging in unfettered celebration, to considering the needs of others and putting animosity aside. All of it has, in one way or another, been a celebration of light in the darkness. The simple ceremony of rebirth each December marked with laughter, contemplation, music, generosity of spirit, revelry, and feasting has been a crucial support to the cultures that celebrate it throughout their many trials and challenges. There is no indication that this expression of determined optimism will be changing anytime soon. If too many plastic reindeer and all the commercial excesses of Christmas can distract from its wider good, we can always make the choice to turn our gaze inward to its real meaning, a meaning that you decide on. So that's it. That's my honoring the holiday season. Happy holidays, everyone. Many blessings. Have an abundant, bountiful, opportunity-filled, colorful new year. And uh, we'll see you then in the new year. Bye, everyone. Love
everyone for watching. Merry Christmas and a happy, happy new year.